Welcome. My name is Jason Thomas. On behalf of Deborah Buford, Manager, Employee Accountability, in Accountability and Workforce Relations at the U.S. Office of Personnel Management, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's live stream entitled, The Hatch Act, Political Activity and the Federal Employee. Our office presents live stream trainings in support of our ongoing effort to bring relevant and reliable developmental opportunities to federal sector employee and labor relations practitioners. Today's presentation will cover the topic of the Hatch Act and issues surrounding political activity in the federal workforce. We encourage everyone to make the most of this live stream, including asking questions of our presenter. You may do so by sending an email to employeeaccountability at opm.gov. We will do our best to field as many questions as possible. Please note that shortly following the presentation, everyone who registered will receive a hyperlink to an online evaluation form courtesy of surveymonkey.com. Simply click the link, follow the instructions, and your valuable instant feedback will be sent to us. Your feedback is important to us and helps us plan future live stream events. We are pleased to have as today's presenter, Anna Galindo Marone from the U.S. Office of Special Counsel. Anna currently serves as the Chief of the Hatch Act Unit at the Special Counsel. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Anna Galindo Marone. Thank you uh, very much. I want to begin by thanking the Office of Personnel Management for inviting me to uh, come here this afternoon and speak about the Hatch Act. Uh, this is a very uh, timely uh, topic, given that we are about three to four weeks out from the midterm elections, as well as the number of issues um, that federal employees are expressing interest in and wishing to discuss at times at work. Um, our office has seen an increase in the number of uh, advisory requests um, showing interest and um, asking questions about what is permissible under the Hatch Act or not, specifically in terms of discussing uh, such current topics as um, Medicare for All or um, even the Kavanaugh confirmation hearing. So this afternoon, I hope to... Um, decipher uh, for, for you all uh, what the Hatch Act permits and what it does not permit. And to that end, um, the roadmap for this afternoon's presentation will first begin uh, with the purpose of the Hatch Act, who's covered by the Hatch Act, permitted activity, prohibited activity, and uh, a brief discussion at the very end um, concerning penalties and how to get additional information from the Office of Special Counsel, which is my agency, and we're the agency responsible for enforcing the Hatch Act. Um, as Jason uh, said during the introduction, please feel free to ask questions during the presentation, and I will try to do my best to answer your questions. Um, as I go through the presentation, there are some big um, and important takeaways that I hope um, um, I can emphasize. And that is that at times when I do uh, presentations, I will have employees come up to me at the end of the presentation, and I recognize that there may have been a disconnect between some of the points that I was trying to make and what the uh, employees understood. And so the two important takeaways for today as, as I work through the permitted and prohibited activities is that the Hatch Act applies to all elections that are partisan. Sometimes the examples that I'll be using during the presentation focus primarily on congressional elections or presidential elections, and then employees come away thinking that the Hatch Act would only apply if um, the, uh, the, the speech is related to presidential elections or congressional elections. And that is not the case. It applies to all elections, including local elections and state um, elections. The second is that um, the Hatch Act applies to all forms of communication. Uh, many of the examples that you will see during the presentation uh, concern employees using social media to advocate for or against candidates or email to talk about candidates and political parties. But it's important to note that it applies to all forms of communications inside and outside of the workplace, and it includes, you know, good old-fashioned face-to-face uh, conversation. 
So I hope to give you plenty of examples uh, during the presentation to illustrate how it applies. So why we have a Hatch Act, I used to not spend time discussing the purpose of the Hatch Act, but over the years, a uh, number of employees have come up to me and uh, expressed concerns that the Hatch Act uh, may infringe on their right to free speech and that they just don't think it's fair. And um, that made me think that it is important to explain the purpose. And, and the purpose is to protect um, our civil service system, that federal employees uh, not be required to perform political chores in order to advance uh, in their federal careers. So basically, a federal employee uh, is, is going to rise base, based on their merit and not their political affiliation. The second reason why we have a Hatch Act concerns um, the protection of our governmental institutions. That the Congress, when they passed this law in 1939, was concerned that even the appearance that our institutions were nonpartisan would be a problem and erode the trust of the citizens in our government programs. So, so again, the, the second reason why we have a Hatch Act um, is really to protect citizens and to ensure that when you approach the federal government for any service or any type of program, that you are treated the same regardless of whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, Green Party, or any other political party affiliation. And in terms of who's covered by the Hatch Act, it covers all executive branch employees except for the president and the vice president. And um, I used to not emphasize so much the exception applying to the president and the vice president, but um, in, since President Trump was elected in 2016, we've, we've had a number of cases involving federal employees and, and some high-level officials retweeting the president's tweets. And, the pre and that's why I now emphasize that the president's not covered because he may, even using um, um, his official Twitter account, for example, tweet something about a candidate or a political party. And because he's not subject to the Hatch Act, um, he's permitted to do that. But any federal employee retweeting one of the president's tweets that is directed at the success or failure of a political party or a candidate for partisan office, if they're retweeting that content on duty or in the federal workplace, would be in violation of the Hatch Act. So that's why I now draw this distinction between the president and the vice president and the, rema and the remainder of the executive branch. So in terms of, of the executive branch employees that are covered, there are two uh, categories. There's your less restricted employees and there's your further restricted employees. The majority of the federal workforce falls under the less restricted category, which means that these federal employees may actively participate in political management and political campaigning subject to the prohibitions that I will be discussing uh, during this presentation. Those employees that are further restricted, in addition to the, the five prohibitions that I will be discussing, are also subject to more expansive restrictions, um, which boils down to the fact that they may not uh, actively participate in political management and political campaigning. Now, the majority of the presentation is going to focus on the five prohibitions that apply to all federal employees, but I will, at the very end, cover the additional restrictions that um, the further restricted employees um, are required to observe. And in case you're wondering if you're further restricted or not, the statute specifically identifies who is further restricted. And as you can see, the Office of Personnel Management is not one of the agencies where all employees are further restricted. It is not one of the enumerated agencies. However, these next four positions, career SES, administrative law judges, contracts appeals board members, and administrative appeals judges, 
regardless of their employing agency, are further restricted. So for example, any career SES employee at the Office of Personnel Management would be further restricted under the Hatch Act. A couple more uh, points to make about coverage before we start discussing the do's and don'ts. Um, one of them has to do with a question that's asked frequently concerning part-time employees versus full-time employees. And um, there is no difference in terms of how the Hatch Act applies, whether a federal employee is part-time or full-time. And in fact, the Hatch Act applies to all employees, even when you're on leave, regardless of whether it's paid or unpaid leave. So um, for example, um, a couple of years back when uh, the federal um, service was furloughed, we received a number of questions at the Office of Special Counsel concerning um, employees' status under the Hatch Act. And even while we were furloughed, we're still considered employees for purposes of the Hatch Act. And this is important because whether you're on leave, paid or unpaid, so whether it's annual leave or some sort of unpaid leave, there are some Hatch Act prohibitions that apply 24-7. And you need to be aware of them so that um, you don't inadvertently, uh, maybe on the weekend, engage in some activity that's prohibited by the Hatch Act. And I'll make sure as I, as I move through the prohibitions to emphasize which prohibitions are considered the 24-7 prohibitions. So in terms of what all employees may do, um, as you can see from the list, these are all examples of, um, of activities that um, fall into two categories. They're either nonpartisan activities, and that's why all employees may engage in these activities, even for the restricted employees, or they are what we considered not active participation in political management or political campaigning. So, um, so to run through the list, the first point is that we can all register and vote as we, uh, as we choose. And I used to never include that point in the slides, but in 2016, we had um, a, an employee call our office uh, very upset because the, uh, the employee had taken leave to go vote in a primary. And uh, the supervisor had found out that the individual um, had taken leave to go vote and called the individual back to the office claiming that they were in violation of the Hatch Act. And clearly voting is not a violation of the Hatch Act and an employee is free to take leave to go um, vote. So that's why I now always include it as the first item on that list. But other things that are permissible under the Hatch Act uh, would include making political contributions to political parties, campaigns, or partisan political groups, attending political rallies, meetings, or fundraisers. Political fundraisers is also permissible. Being a member of a political party, political club um, is also permissible. Signing nominating petitions and being candidates for public office in nonpartisan elections. Also campaigning for and against referendum questions, constitutional amendments, or municipal ordinances. Again, these items, whether it's a ballot initiative or a constitutional amendment, these are considered nonpartisan uh, matters, even though arguably sometimes these issues are viewed as being more affiliated with one political party or another. These are still considered nonpartisan matters. Also permissible is following, liking, or commenting on the social media pages of a candidate for partisan political office or political party or partisan political group. Displaying campaign yard signs at home is permissible, as well as um, displaying a bumper sticker on your vehicle. A couple of points regarding um, all of these items. All of these, as I indicated early on, are permissible but they are still qualified by some of the, of the Hatch Act prohibitions. For example, none of these ex activities, um, for ex like, like liking or following, commenting on the social media page of a candidate, should occur while you're on duty, 
um, or in a federal workplace, or signing a nominating petition, or making a political contribution, right, or attending a political rally. All of these, you have to be off duty and not at work, and you must engage in these activities in your personal capacity, not your official capacity. Um, and in fact, before I move to the next slide, there's a couple of other points I'd like to cover here. So the last point on the slide talks about campaign yard signs and bumper stickers, and I want to take each in turn. Occasionally, I will have federal employees call me and explain that they telework, and they're confused about whether because they're teleworking, they can then display a campaign yard sign. They're, they're basically asking whether sort of their home has become part of like the federal complex or the federal office. And the answer is, of course, you can display a campaign yard sign at home, even if you're teleworking. Of course, we did have an incident where a federal employee um, was working from home and used Skype for business for a conference call, and the person could be seen um, working from home, and the individual forgot to cover some of the partisan posters they had in their office. So that would be an occasion where you do have to cover any of the partisan items you may have inside your home if you're going to be involved in a conference call where people can see the items that are near you. Um, the other item is bumper stickers. And whether you drive your car, your personal car, to a federally owned or federally subsidized lot, the regs do allow federal employees to display a bumper sticker on their vehicle. Often, people will ask if it's just a bumper sticker because that's how the regs read. And our position at OSC has been that you can display two or three bumper stickers, but turning your car into a campaign mobile would be the Hatch Act violation. So for example, we've had occasion to issue warning letters to federal employees that have um, driven a pickup truck to work and when they park the vehicle, then they then pull out a huge sign and attach it to the back of the pickup, tr pickup truck. That would be a campaign mobile. Or we've had federal employees uh, t pull out of their vehicle what those campaign tents that you can put on the top of your car, and they will place it on top of their car once they've arrived at the federal parking lot. Of course, these are prohibited. But again, several bumper stickers would not be a violation. So in addition to what may, all federal employees may do, this list applies to less restricted employees. These are additional examples of what less restricted employees may also do. And as you can see, these are all examples of partisan political campaigning and partisan political management. Circulating nominating petitions, volunteering to work on a campaign, distributing campaign literature, organizing campaign events, speaking on behalf of a candidate, holding party office, serving as a delegate to a party convention, organizing party events, and serving on a, on a political party's, uh, any of its committees. All of these are things that less restricted employees may do as long as, again, they're not on duty, not in a federal building, and they're engaged in these activities in their personal capacity, not in their official capacity as a federal employee. Okay, so the, the, the majority of, of the presentation um, is going to be spent discussing the, the five prohibitions that I earlier alluded to in the opening remarks. The first four prohibitions that are up on your screen are what we call the 24-7 prohibitions. And they are, and by the way, these apply to all federal employees. Employees may not use their official authority or influence to affect the outcome of an election. Federal employees may not solicit, accept, or receive political contributions. Um, employees may not be candidates in partisan elections, and they may not solicit or discourage the political activity of any person with business before their employing office. In addition, um, there's a workplace prohibition, 
and that is that employees may not engage in political activity while on duty, in the federal workplace, or wearing a government uniform or badge, or operating a government vehicle. And before I break down those five prohibitions and give you examples of exactly what these prohibitions um, capture, um, it's important to understand the definition of political activity. Um, the, the definition is found in the Hatch Act regulations, and it has been interpreted broadly by the courts. Political activity means any activity that is directed toward the success or failure of a partisan candidate. Let me say that again. Uh, toward the success or failure of a candidate for partisan office, political party, or partisan political group. And in order for something to be subject to the Hatch Act, it must fall within the four corners of this prohibition. Because we get a lot of questions in the office about, you know, can I do this, can I do that, or, or I believe my coworker is violating the Hatch Act because they're expressing their views on X. And a lot of what is filed with our office does not meet this definition. So that's why I wanted to spend some time exploring uh, exactly what this means. So for example, if I'm at work and I know that I have uh, two coworkers that live in the same county that I live in, and there's a school board race that's coming up and the, the race is nonpartisan, the Hatch Act would not prohibit me, even at work, from sending my coworkers an email encouraging them to vote for this particular candidate in a school board race, okay? The reason the Hatch Act would not prohibit me from doing that is because the race is nonpartisan. If the race were partisan, like for example, a presidential election, then sending an email or engaged in, engaging in social media activity, expressing my views about a candidate or a political party would be prohibited. Okay, um, a couple more examples here that come up. So right now there are a number of questions that we're receiving about issues, about whether federal employees can talk about um, the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings, about Affordable Care Act, that still is a popular uh, topic, whether it should be repealed, whether we should go to a single payer system, uh, gun gun control, defense of the Second Amendment, um, abortion, either side of the issue. Some people want to have signs up in their office showing support for Planned Parenthood. Some people want to display support for right to life. Uh, immigration, signs on building the wall. Um, these are all current issues that um, federal employees are asking about. And as long as the conversation at work, whether it's face-to-face -face or in writing, does not tie the issue to a political party or a candidate for partisan office. It is not political activity under the Hatch Act. So for example, and this, these are real examples, people ask regularly if they can wear NRA buttons at work, and the answer is yes. Merely wearing an NRA button that shows your support for the NRA is not a Hatch Act violation. But if I now put up a sign in my office that said, support the NRA and vote for, and you fill in the blank with a political party or a candidate for partisan office, now you have political activity under the Hatch Act. And so the sign would be prohibited, okay? Same thing with any of the issues. I had a number of people wanting to express their views uh, in the last two weeks on the Kavanaugh confirmation process. And regardless of what side of the issue you were on, as long as the statements were limited to the confirmation process and it was not about showing support for a political party or um, a candidate for partisan office, those conversations were not prohibited at work. However, let me emphasize that although something is not prohibited under the Hatch Act, you may still want to consider uh, talking to your ethics office um, at, or, um, and each, each division or each regional office should have some ethics um, official 
um, that can address your questions in terms of standards of conduct or even agency computer use uh, policy. Because I just gave you an example that's not subject to the Hatch Act, right? Someone emailing their colleagues about a school board race and who they should vote for. And I said that's not a violation because it's nonpartisan. However, some agencies may have very strict rules about how uh, employees may use um, an agency computer. You know, there are limits in terms of using it for personal use. So it's always good to not only think about the Hatch Act and whether the Hatch Act prohibits your activity, but also think about the standards of conduct and any policies your agency may have. And when in doubt, I always say talk to your ethics officials or call our office. And I'll provide contact information at the end of the presentation. The next point that I wanted to make here about political activity has to do with a number of questions that have come up about um, marches and rallies. Um, there's been an increase in the number of employees asking whether they can participate in marches like the March for Life, Women's March, March for Science, etc. And the Hatch Act does not prohibit a federal employee from participating in an issue march or rally. Um, the Hatch Act may be implicated at the rally if, for example, you engage in activity that would fall under the Hatch Act. And what I mean by that is that I've seen sometimes when I've seen some of these marches televised, the news footage, footage some employees or some, some of the participants may be holding up signs, right, that, that indicate support for a candidate or express uh, opposition, you know, defeat someone in 2020. And if you're holding such a sign, now you're engaged in political activity. But merely attending an issue rally is not political activity, but some of your conduct at the event might be. Um, as I look at my notes, I also want to point out that we uh, regularly receive questions in the office in this category of whether this is political activity or not. We receive questions about uh, posters or T-shirts that display a Black Lives Matter. And we've advised that um, that is not political activity unless um, the statement Black Lives Matter is somehow attached to a political party or a candidate for partisan office, um, that would be prohibited by the Hatch Act. But if all the poster or the T-shirt says is Black Lives Matter, that is not prohibited by the Hatch Act. So the first prohibition that, that I wanted to explore more fully is what I described as the workplace prohibition. These, these are the concerns that every federal employee, in terms of if you're thinking about discussing political issues or candidates at work, you need to keep this prohibition in mind. And that is that all federal employees may not engage in political activity while on duty or in a government room or building or wearing an official uniform or insignia or using a government vehicle. Now, most of us won't have to worry about using a government vehicle. But if you use a government vehicle, please be aware that it cannot be used in any fashion for political activity purposes, including while you're in the vehicle using a personal device to, for example, express your views about a candidate. That would violate the Hatch Act because you're using a government vehicle and you're engaged in political activity. Okay. On duty is exactly that. If you're on duty at work, whether you're in the office or you're teleworking from home, you're subject to the Hatch Act. Um, and for those of you that belong to a union, even if you're working on what's considered like official union time, that's considered on duty for purposes of the Hatch Act, okay? Um, in a, in a government room or building includes break rooms, conference rooms, gyms, cafeterias, and union offices. Sometimes federal employees uh, will tell me that they were at lunch, 
They were in the agency's cafeteria and they were using a personal device to send emails or post to social media their support for a candidate. Even though they were off duty because they were still in the federal building, because they were inside the federal building where, there's, where the cafeteria is, in, is inside the federal building, they were still subject to this prohibition. So if it's lunchtime and you want to use your personal device to engage in political activity, you need to leave the federal premises. You basically need to go across the street, whether it's a Starbucks or some other uh, location, to engage in political activity. Um, wearing an official uniform or insignia uh, sometimes comes up even in the context of uh, weekend activity. And what I mean by that is that maybe someone over the weekend um, has decided, the example that I talked about, going to a, an issue march. And you decide that you're going to the issue march and you're going to wear your OPM t-shirt. But you're also holding a sign that says support or defeat X candidate. Now you're engaged in political activity while wearing official insignia. So you have to be careful that if you're engaged in political activity that you don't have anything on you um, that reflects um, where you work. Um, let me just go through my notes to make sure I haven't left anything out. So gyms, uh, some of you may work in facilities where there are federal gyms. As we get closer to the elections, I often have federal employees wanting to know whether they can wear campaign t-shirts uh, to the federal gym, and they may not. If the gym is inside the federal facility, it is subject to these Hatch Act rules. So um, before I go to this next slide, I want to go back. Um, there is an exception that applies to this on-duty prohibition. I'm just going to very briefly state the prohibition. So I earlier said that this workplace prohibition applies to all federal employees. There's an exception, and that is as to presidential appointees with Senate confirmation. They may engage in political activity on duty or in a federal room or building as long as the cost associated with the political activity is not borne by the government. So any presidential appointee with Senate confirmation here at OPM would be would fall under this exception. And the other thing that I would like to emphasize about this exception is that it only applies to the PAS. It does not apply to any um, of the supporting staff for the PAS, even though they may be politicals, whether they're Schedule Cs or non-career SES. The exception only applies to the PAS, meaning that the support staff cannot facilitate um, the political activity that, that the PAS may engage in, um, including, for example, if the PAS has a political meeting in their office, the, the, su the support staff may not be present, take notes, or even set up um, the meeting. So that's just to explain how the exception works. So... In regard to the rest, you know, of the federal employees that are that are subject to this workplace prohibition, um, expressing your views about a candidate or a political um, party can can manifest itself in many ways. Over the years, I've seen um, a number of things in terms of how federal employees uh, sometimes try to express their views about a candidate or a political party. And these are just some examples. You've got your traditional, you know, wearing a campaign button. You've got T-shirts, hats with MAGA, Make America Great Again. In the last election cycle, we had a number of, of hats that we had to tell people during the election uh, to um, remove. Um, screensavers, people will use their screensavers to show their support or opposition to candidates or political parties. That's not permissible. Clearly, campaign posters or any poster, even if it's homemade, if it's expressing your views about a candidate or a political party, are also prohibited. And um, making campaign online donations. Although you can make a campaign donation, you have to make sure you're doing that 
when you're not in the federal building. We've seen a rise in, in the number of uh, cases where federal employees at lunch think it's permissible to use their agency computer to make a campaign donation, and it's not. That is, that is political activity, and it's prohibited. Also, displaying candidate photographs at work um, is prohibited. There is an exception, and it, and it typically only applies to the president and the vice president when they are running for re-election, and that's because the president and the vice president continue to be the, the heads of the executive branch even while they are running for re-election. So in recognition of that, um, our office has issued guidance that the only photographs of the president and the vice president that may be on display in federal buildings during uh, a presidential election cycle, and we find ourselves in one already, um, would be official photographs of the president. And the official photographs um, do not mean um, cutouts from the newspaper, downloads from the computer. These are official photographs um, that have been officially issued, and um, they must be displayed in traditional size and manner. Over the years, we've seen the official photograph blown up to life-size dimensions. That's prohibited. We've seen pictures of the president displayed upside down. That's prohibited. Um, we've seen people draw halos or horns on pictures, official uh, photographs of the president. That does not fall under traditional size and manner. So again, it has to be official. It must be displayed in its traditional form and size. Still discussing this um, on-duty workplace prohibition, and the reason I'm spending so much time on this is because a good majority of the cases we receive concern, concern this prohibition. The majority of Hatch Act violations involve federal employees uh, engaged in political activity on duty. So that's why I'm spending so much time on this prohibition. And the majority of the violations involve emailing, blogging, tweeting, and posting to social media. And so I, I want to emphasize that even though the Hatch Act, as I said earlier, applies to all forms of communications, including the good old-fashioned face-to-face communication at work, it certainly applies to emailing and tweeting and posting to social media. And often people will, you know, as a defense, they will say that even though this was an on-duty activity, they thought it was okay because they were using their personal device or a personal email account. It doesn't matter if you're using a personal account or personal device. If you're in the federal workplace or on duty, you're subject to the prohibition. Same thing, federal employees will tell me that they were sharing, sharing or forwarding content authored by others. So it's, you know, they didn't write it themselves. It doesn't matter. That's no different than distributing campaign literature on behalf of a campaign or a candidate. Employees will also tell me that they were just merely sharing or forwarding to their friends or like-minded coworkers. And as I often emphasize um, to individuals that, that share this with me, many times it is your like-minded coworker that actually reported um, the complaint. So, so you need to be aware that just because you think you're sharing this information with people that are like-minded, it still constitutes political activity. In fact, often the people that we target in terms of our political activity are the people that we know are like-minded in order to keep them excited and motivated about going and making sure that they vote. So the fact that you all agree about a candidate doesn't mean it's not political activity. Lastly, um, we often see violations involving union email, meaning that um, someone that, that holds an office uh, within the union has emailed the members um, an email that maybe lists a number of, of, of union items. But among those items is information about um, a candidate that the union has endorsed or even about uh, trying to recruit 
members to canvas a neighborhood on behalf of a candidate um, over the weekend. That type of communication, if it's occurring in a federal building or on duty, is prohibited. Okay. Um, one question that comes up often with email um, has to do with receiving partisan content. People will ask me often, what about receiving an email from the DNC or the RNC or from a campaign? Is that a hatchback violation? And the answer is no. Merely receiving uh, partisan content is not a violation. The concern is what the federal employee does was with the partisan content once they've received it. And to be on the safe side, the best thing to do is to delete it. Once you've read it, you delete it. Because if you forward it to others, you're violating the Hatch Act. So just to recap um, this discussion on the workplace prohibition and some of the concepts that I've discussed, including what is political activity and what is not. So here we have two mugs. Um, one is pro-life and the other one is I, loved, um, I love Planned Parenthood. And both of these would be permissible at work if you displayed them on your desk because they don't uh, refer to a political party or a candidate for partisan office. The next example involves uh, two mugs. One has a picture of the president and it commemorates the inauguration. And the, the other one ha says, never apologize for being right and it has the, the RNC uh, logo. And both of these would be prohibited at work currently. Um, I say currently because up until March of 2018, the mug with the picture of the president would have been permissible. There was a period of time from the moment the president was elected up until he formally became a candidate um, in March where displays that showed support or opposition to the president were permissible. But once he became a candidate for re-election, just like every other incumbent before him, all the displays showing support and opposition have to be removed except for the official photographs that I discussed earlier. So the next three Normally, when I have a live audience, it's interesting to see what the audience thinks about whether these are permissible or not. Um, often, uh, people will conclude that displaying things that say I'm a liberal or I'm a conservative um, would be prohibited at work. And the answer is, 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 is that you may display these, all three of these, build the wall, proud conservative and proud of my liberal values. Um, We've concluded that these are not enough to show your support or opposition to a political party or candidate for partisan office, okay? There are plenty of people that are conservative that sometimes vote for a political party that you would not associate necessarily with conservative views. Same thing, you've got people that consider themselves liberal and voted for um, someone of the opposing party. So our view is that unless it's clearly indicating Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, or some other political party, we're not going to draw conclusions from just merely identifying yourself as a conservative or a liberal. We see that as being tied more to issues. Same thing with build the wall. Okay, oops, sorry about that. So um, the next grouping, um, all of these are currently prohibited. As I said, once the president became a candidate for re-election in March, we issued guidance, um, which is still available on our website, informing all federal employees that they needed to put away any items that showed support or opposition for the president. And um, the hashtag MAGA continues to be one where we're getting complaints. We've had federal employees with hashtag MAGA as part of their official signature block. We've even had some federal employees with the quoting the Make America Great Again. And now that the president is a candidate, all of this needs to be removed from 
the workplace, including um, email signature block. Um, same thing goes for any of you that might uh, be responsible for uh, working on your agency's official Twitter account or website. Um, hashtag MAGA, we've advised certain federal agencies that they are not per permitted in their press releases or in their use of their official Twitter account to include the hashtag MAGA um, on, on those accounts. And some, again, with a live audience, sometimes I get questions here about why MAGA if it's associated with the 2016 campaign. And the reason is that um, we have always advised when we have an incumbent president, whether you're, whether you're displaying material from the previous election or from the upcoming election, these are still items that are showing support for the president as a candidate. And we've always advised that they need to be put away until after the election. So that being said, after 2020, if President Trump were to be reelected, then the items that are up on the screen right now, either showing support or opposition, would be permissible again in the workplace. And the next group, uh, Deep State University, Make America Great Again, Putin, uh, Trump 2020, and Trump uh, for President in 2016. Um, we've advised that um, similarly, uh, with the exception of the of the Putin Trump one, which um, is not a real ticket, um, we've said that the remaining examples um, would be prohibited. Of course, we've talked about MAGA, and I've also mentioned that any item that's showing support in 2016 is still going to be prohibited for the upcoming 2020 election. Deep State University currently has become so um, intertwined or associated with this idea that there's um, federal employees working to defeat the president, that we've, we are advising federal employees that they should not be dis, uh, wearing um, Deep State University items or for that matter, like hashtag resist, which has also become very um, associated with defeating President Trump. Again, all of these restrictions apply only while on duty or in a federal building. So these items, certainly you can display them at home and you can also wear them out on the weekend as long as you're not coming into work. Because if you're in the federal building, even on the weekend, you can't wear these items. Okay. The next group I think probably ev everybody recognizes that these would be prohibited in any way, shape, or form in terms of a display at work. They're either showing support or opposition for a political party. And are there any questions? Uh, we, we do have a number of questions if okay. you want to take a few right now. Sure. Great. Um, so the first one's a little bit of a two-parter. Um, how can you simply distinguish a partisan election from a nonpartisan election and the second part of that is, say, a federally less restricted federal employee may actually not just campaign, but even run as a candidate during off-duty hours for a nonpartisan political office. Is that correct, such as a city council position or something? Yes. Okay. So um, the difference between a partisan and a nonpartisan election is, um, and I'm giving you just a very sort of basic, because the, the actual definition is very technical. But basically, if you have at least one candidate in any race running with political party affiliation, that constitutes a partisan race for purposes of the Hatch Act. So if you have five independents or one Republican or one Democratic candidate in a race, that's partisan. And one of the things, uh, look, um, it's usually um, your local uh, elections board is very helpful if you're not sure whether an election is partisan or nonpartisan. You can usually call the Board of Elections for your jurisdiction, and they normally can assist you in determining whether the election is partisan or not. The other thing that you can do, and it's so easy now with the internet, you can also pull up um, the ballot for any given race, especially if you want to see if historically the race has been partisan or not. And if party affiliation shows um, 
next it appears next to a candidate's name. Like when we go vote for president, it'll have like, you know, uh, President Trump or Donald J. Trump, Republican. And whatever candidates or, you know, additional candidates are going to be there will also have their party affiliation. So that's another quick way of determining whether an election is partisan or not. Um, but all it takes is one candidate in the race to run with party affiliation to turn it partisan. And the second part of, of that is that, yes, if you have a nonpartisan election in your community, like for city council or school board, then a federal employee would be permitted uh, to run um, in said election. Okay, great. Um, another question that we received from one of our webcast viewers. Um, there's a collective bargaining agreement at this person's agency um, representing non-appropriated fund employees, and it states within Section 12 of their CBA that they're allowed to wear a button on their uniform while at work. The question is, can that button endorse a political candidate when within that Section 12 says specifically uh, one of the provisions, the buttons do not violate law or security? I would... Um I would venture to say, I, I believe the answer is that you cannot wear a political button, but there are some non-appropriated fund employees that are not subject to the Hatch Act. So it may be that this question is actually even outside of uh, our jurisdiction. So um, I would want to know more in order uh, to provide the best answer. So I don't know if there's a way that we can uh, get in touch with with the um, with the person that's asking the question, and we can get a more specific answer to them. We could certainly do that. Um, maybe a little more of a general question mm -hmm. for you here from one of our viewers: um, How should political activities of contractors in the workplace mm -hmm. in a federal workplace be addressed? Well, that that's a great question, and that is one of the um, w an issue that comes up often. Um, the Hatch Act, as I said earlier, applies to all executive branch employees. And um, when you look at the definition of, of an employee under the Hatch Act, it's someone that's employed or holding office in an executive agency, and it does not cover independent contractors. So it does, the Hatch Act does apply to individuals that are hired under a personal service contract with some exceptions. But if you're an independent contractor, the Hatch Act does not apply. However, I've spoken to a number of agencies who have um, explored their employment contract with the independent um, contractor to ensure that at least on-duty activity um, observes the Hatch Act. So there are some agencies, as I understand it, that have included some language that basically uh, makes clear to uh, the contractor that employees, while on duty or in a federal building, have to observe certain standards of conduct, including not engaging in political activity on duty. Great. Thank you. Um, we have a couple more I think we could get to pretty quickly here. Sure. Um, the question is, if you receive an unsolicited partisan political email from an outside entity, that of which you were referring to earlier, uh, may you forward that email to your personal email before you delete it? Yes. So let's say that you receive an email from the DNC or the RNC at work. You may, um, I earlier said the best practice is to delete it. You may forward it to yourself, and then when you're home and not on duty, you may forward it to others if that's what you're thinking of doing with the email. But you have to make sure that it does not include a solicitation for political contributions. As you can see from the slide that's uh, at present is up, the fundraising prohibition is a 24-7 prohibition. And as long as you're a federal employee, you may never solicit, accept, or receive political contributions. So forwarding or sharing content with others that includes a request for political contribution would be prohibited even if you're at home and you're not on duty. But assuming that the email that you are forwarding to yourself does not include a solicitation, you may, from home, then forward it to others.
Great. Uh, one more, and then we'll let you continue, okay. and then maybe have time for a couple more at the end. Um, this person has several questions, but I think uh, one that would be the most apropos is, uh, will you be covering or can you explain the differences uh, in the Hatch Act law for National Guard service members and are those in the Army Reserves? Yeah, so members of the uniformed services are not covered by the Hatch Act. But there is a, uh, a DOD directive that um, sort of is very similar in terms of the political activity restrictions that apply to members of the uniformed services. It tracks very closely the Hatch Act, but the Office of Special Counsel, my agency, is not responsible for enforcement of that directive. Okay. So um, the next prohibition, and it's the first prohibition that, as I said earlier, is a 24-7 prohibition. So basically, as long as you're employed by the federal government, there is never going to be a time when you can solicit, accept, or receive political contributions. Um, to give you an example, I often receive requests from federal employees that right before the midterm elections or right before a presidential election, they uh, plan to take a week off to go um, campaign for a candidate. And they want to know, even though they're going to be on leave, what they can and can't do. And one of the prohibitions that I carefully go over is this one having to do with fundraising. Because as a volunteer for a candidate, you may be asked to maybe canvass a neighborhood. And sometimes canvassing could be for votes, which is fine if you're less restricted. But if you're canvassing for money, for political contributions, that would be prohibited. Similarly, working a phone bank, if what you're asking um, those on the receiving end of the line, right, when you're working a phone bank is for political contributions, that would be prohibited. Even if no one knows that you're a federal employee, because people will say I'm anonymous when I'm working a phone bank. That's not an exception to the Hatch Act. Um, so even working a phone bank, if, if you're asking for donations, that would be prohibited. Forwarding emails um, from a campaign or a political party or from anyone, if the email includes a solicitation for political contributions, whether it's a donate button or a link, or maybe it's just a request. It says, here's great information about a candidate, and this candidate needs your help. Please contribute $10. That's a solicitation which would be prohibited. Um, same thing with social media. If um, you receive on your social media page, if someone posts information about a candidate and the information includes a request for political contributions, you may not like it, you may not share it, because if you do, it's now become your solicitation. Same thing on, on a Twitter account. Um, if someone tweets um, some request for political contributions, you may not retweet um, that political contribution. Um, distributing campaign literature. Let's say that you're volunteering for a campaign and you've been asked to canvas a neighborhood and distribute campaign literature. Make sure that what you're handing out to um, individuals does not include a solicitation for political contributions, as that, again, would be a violation of this fundraising prohibition. Similarly, hosting a fundraiser in your home is also prohibited. However, if there's someone else in your home that is not uh, subject to the Hatch Act, they may host a fundraiser in your home, make sure that your name does not appear anywhere on that invitation or in any way your name is used to suggest that you are a host of the event. Um, you also want to make sure that, um, for example, we've, I've had cases where spouses will say, you know, invitation to a fundraiser for candidate X and X, you know, candidate X at the home of Mary and John. And John is the federal employee. Now John is in trouble because it looks like John is hosting the fundraiser. So you need to be careful that if someone else in your home is going to host a fundraiser, that your name is not in any way associated with the event. Um, inviting others to a fundraiser is also uh, a violation of the fundraising prohibition. 
So if you receive an invitation from a campaign or a political party, for example, and it's $200 to attend, and you now send that invitation on forward to your friends, seeing if they're interested in attending with you, you've now engaged in a solicitation. The only way that you can have others attend a fundraiser with you is if you pay in advance for their ticket. So let's say it's $200 a seat. If you want to purchase two seats for yourself and your date, you can then invite someone to attend with you because it no longer requires that person to pay to attend, okay? Because you've paid for their admission. Um, let me give you a couple of examples here. We had a federal employee in 2008 who received an email from the DNC, and the email provided a lot of information showing support for then uh, Senator Obama. And at the end of the email, it provided, uh, it, it included a request for donations and a link to, to make the donations. And the federal employee sent that email to 40 friends and coworkers. It did not involve subordinates. Um, the individual, um, we took that case to the uh, Merit Systems Protection Board, and the individual received a 120-day suspension for that one email to 40 friends and coworkers. So I, I use this example to emphasize how serious these violations can be. Um, this, th this case, which is known as Special Counsel v. Mark, um, this federal employee did not have any prior history of violating the Hatch Act, had good disciplinary history, but the, the, the penalty provisions for the Hatch Act are significant. Um, we also had a supervisor who um, was attending, uh, had received an invitation to a uh, gubernatorial candidate's uh, political fundraiser, and she knew that there was someone else in her office who um, supported the candidate. And so she went up to this individual who was her subordinate and told her that she knew this was a little bit outside of the rules, but handed her the invitation to the fundraiser. And um, we received a complaint, and we took that case to the Merit Systems Protection Board where we litigate these cases, and the individual was removed from employment um, for that one, um, for extending that one invitation to one individual. So I emphasize that fundraising, the fundraising solicitation prohibition is one that um, is seriously looked at. The other thing that I would share here is that um, when we at OSC receive a complaint and we have a reasonable belief that the fundraising occurred while, you know, in the federal workplace, the solicitation occurred at work, we um, have to, we're, we contact the Department of Justice, the Public Integrity Division, and uh, talk to them about the case because there are criminal provisions that we're not responsible for, but the Department of Justice is concerning solicitations in the federal workplace. And from time to time, they will uh, accept these cases. And in fact, when we talk about the use of official authority, I'll highlight um, one such case. Let me just take a look at my notes real quickly to make sure that I am not missing anything in this area. Um, so like I said, to recap, um, as a federal employee, you may not solicit, accept, or receive at any time and by any means. So whether it's social media, email, handing out something that's a solicitation, you really need to be careful about what it is that you're um, passing on. So the only fundraising exception here applies to um, members of the union. If you are a union member, you may solicit, accept, or receive a political contribution, but only if the person you're soliciting belongs to the same federal um, union, the person solicited is not a subordinate, and the request for the contribution is to the union's PAC. 
and the, the solicitation is occurring off-duty and outside the federal workplace. So there are, there are still, even though there's an exception here for fundraising, you have to make sure that you know how this exception works. It can't happen at work. It can't happen on duty. You can't involve a subordinate. And it has to be um, for the union's PAC. And it can't be that you're soliciting others that don't belong to the union. You have to make sure that who you're soliciting belongs to the same uh, labor organization that you belong to. And these are just examples about uh, showing um, that liking or sharing a political fundraising uh, post on Facebook is prohibited. And we use Facebook as an example, but it can be Twitter, can be LinkedIn, it can be any social media platform. Same thing with re retweeting a political fundraiser. This would be, or a political fundraising post, this would be prohibited. So the next prohibition, um, and often I emphasize that it's, it's the reason why we have a Hatch Act, concerns um, the use of official authority. That is, that as a federal employee, we may not use our official authority or influence to affect the outcome of an election. And the majority of the cases here arise in, in the context of the employee, of uh, the uh, supervisor subordinate relationship. And the case law looks at the relationship between the supervisor and a subordinate as inherently coercive. Therefore, no magic words are necessary when a supervisor is asking, advising, directing, or requesting that a subordinate engage in political activity. It will be viewed under the law as inherently coercive and a violation of the Hatch Act. So let me give you a couple of examples here. I've had cases where a supervisor will send uh, a couple of days before an election an email, subject line says FYI, and then it provides four or five reasons why uh, showing how, uh, you know, how favorable a particular candidate is in a given race. Even though the email does not say vote or you must vote or please tell me how you're going to vote, the mere sending of that email suggesting to a subordinate how to vote is a Hatch Act violation and one that we would consider a very serious one. Um, another example, and this is actually a case, um, we had several years back in 2008, we had a supervisor who at the beginning of a meeting um, po polled his staff to figure out who they were going to vote for in the 2008 presidential election. And how he did this, he basically began the meeting by telling them that he was a lifelong Republican but for the first time was going to be voting uh, for the Democratic candidate in the presidential election. He then gave all the reasons why he was going to vote for then-Senator Obama and then asked those in attendance to raise their hand and identify whether they were going to vote the same way he was. And then he pointed to the folks that did not raise their hand and asked them, why not? As you can imagine, we received a number of complaints at the end of um, that meeting. And we quickly investigated that case and filed a complaint with the Merit Systems Protection Board. Um, the, the resolution of that case is that we settled that case. The individual immediately resigned from federal employment and agreed to a permanent debarment from federal employment. Um, we viewed that as a very serious violation and, in fact, this individual worked at a further restricted agency where you would think there would be a, 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 a heightened uh, level of interest and awareness of the Hatch Act. But he indicated, when we asked him why he did this, that he saw it as an icebreaker. He thought that um, polling the staff on who they were going to vote for in the presidential election was no different than asking his staff at the beginning of a meeting who they thought was going to win uh, Survivor. So um, we certainly did not agree with him, and that's why we filed a complaint with the Merit Systems Protection Board. Another example here 
which illustrates both the prohibited use of official authority and why we have a Hatch Act, as well as uh, some serious uh, violations of the solicitation prohibition. We had a career SES employee uh, in 2012 who uh, informed a GS-15 that he was going to create um, a PAC to help President Obama get reelected in 2012. And uh, he asked her to make a $2,500 contribution to the PAC. This individual did not make a contribution. He then called her at home, reminding her of the PAC and that she should make a contribution. He also promised her that if she made the contribution, he assumed he was going to rise in the ranks um, if President Obama, Obama got elected, reelected, and that he would promote her and, and help her get into the career SES, uh, into the career senior executive service, uh, basically creating a pay-to-play scheme. Um, in addition, he gave her a glowing, this is all happening during the performance appraisal period, so he gave her a glowing performance appraisal and then told her that she was going to receive a bonus to accompany that appraisal and told her it was for $2,500 and indicated to her pretty boldly that she should use the bonus money to make a political contribution to the PAC. Um, finally, the employee came to us, and you can see why these cases are so serious, because if you report your supervisor as soon as we begin investigating this case, the supervisor is going to know that who the employee was that reported him. The reason she finally came to us was because one evening he came to her and uh, purported to show her a check written by another employee and indicated that now that this person had made the contribution, it was her turn. So she came to us, um, as you just from the, the conversation we've been having about on the Hatch Act, he violated the political activity on duty restriction because it was on duty and in the federal workplace. He's soliciting for political contributions. In addition, because he's a supervisor over a subordinate, he's also using his official authority to interfere with the results of an election. Um, we found this witness very credible, the, the subject, and we contacted the Department of Justice, as I mentioned earlier, because the solicitations were taking place in the federal workplace. Justice took this case, and unfortunately, they were not able, they took it to a grand jury, and they were not able to indict the federal official. So the case came back to us, and we got uh, what, what I consider a lucky break. We decided to investigate this case because our burden of proof is not as, as, as high as that in a criminal matter. Um, and while we were investigating our case, um, an attorney from the general counsel's office at this agency learned of the investigation and came forward to tell us that she had also been solicited by this individual at an agency event. So... We, we, now we had two witnesses. These individuals did not know each other, but we had now a witness corroborating the other. And so we filed a complaint with the Merit Systems Protection Board, and this individual uh, resigned immediately as well. So that's just to illustrate how serious sometimes these Hatch Act violations can be and why we have a Hatch Act to exactly protect federal employees from this type of conduct. The, the second item that comes up in this area um, does not involve supervisors and subordinates, but it involves um, the abuse of, of one's title or position in order to uh, gain leverage for a candidate, right? You know, depending on the position that you have, if, if it's a high-level position, you may be asked to speak at a political event on behalf of the candidate, and you may find that uh, it bolsters what you're saying about the candidate if you use your official title or position. That would be a violation of the Hatch Act. If you're supporting a candidate and you're speaking about the candidate, whether it's posting to social media or whether it's at a campaign event, you must engage in this type of activity in your personal capacity, not as a government official. Um, the other item that falls um, under this prohibition is, is the use of, of agency resources, right? It's the use of our position in order to assist a candidate. And, and that can, can take several forms. 
One would be, I've seen, um, and this also got referred to the Department of Justice, I've seen um, law enforcement officials take information from a law enforcement database and turn it over to a campaign in order to assist a candidate. That's a clear violation of the Hatch Act, but it also raises some criminal concerns, and that's why we would call the Department of Justice. Additionally, um, I'll, I'll share another case with you, and this was a case that we also went and, and litigated. There was an individual at the IRS who worked at a call center, and this individual um, would provide advice to taxpayers when they would call needing assistance on, on tax-related matters. And this individual decided several weeks before the 2012 presidential election that he was going to tell the taxpayers to um, vote for Obama. And so every time what he devised was this cute little jingle that every time at the end of a conversation with a taxpayer that the taxpayer would ask his name, he found a way to use his last name to communicate his political views. And it was something like E for elect, O for Obama, N in November. He was using letters from his name to basically tell taxpayers to elect Obama in November. And as you can imagine, um, our hotline received several complaints from taxpayers. We investigated this case, clearly a prohibited use of official authority. And um, uh, surprisingly, the, all these calls are recorded for quality control. So it was not very difficult to gather the evidence to show that in one day, we, we looked at one day, um, he had told 11 taxpayers to vote for Obama in November. Um, and he had been doing this for weeks. So we filed a complaint with the Merit Systems Protection Board and the individual received a 100-day suspension without pay. So again, serious consequences um, for violating the Hatch Act. Um, the next slide is just a recap of all the social media guidance that applies to all federal employees. And I, I bring it up under the use of official authority because often people will ask, whether they can have their on the um, their Facebook profile, for example, they are interested in being able to fill out the fields and indicate where they work. And the question becomes, you know, am I permitted to to you know show where I work, but then where I post my views show support or opposition for a candidate or a political party? And the answer is yes. That merely filling out the fields. And then at some later date, expressing your views about political parties or candidates on your social media account is not a violation of the use of official authority. But what would be, would be if, for example, where you post your views about a candidate or a political party, you indicated that because you work here at OPM, you think that this individual would be best for issues involving um, benefits and federal employees. That's an example of now using your official position to influence the outcome of, of an election. That would be prohibited. But merely filling out the fields of your Facebook or Twitter accounts is not prohibited. The next prohibition um, concerns candidacy, and already some of your questions covered a little bit on candidacy, but there's still a couple of things to go over. So candidacy, just like the use of official authority prohibition and the fundraising, is a 24-7 prohibition. So as long as you're a federal employee, you may not be a candidate for public office in partisan elections. However, there are a couple of exceptions, one we've covered. If um, the, the race you're interested in is nonpartisan, then as a federal employee, you would be permitted uh, to run and seek that office. But you just need to make sure that the election at is issue is nonpartisan. In addition, there are some federal employees that live in specially designated localities. And these localities are mostly 
in, um, well, the District of Columbia is one such locality, but also many of the jurisdictions that surround the District of Columbia. So, for example, Arlington, Alexandria, Beth Bethesda, Chevy Chase, Rockville, just to name a few, are specially designated localities. And if you live in one of these, you are permitted to run for local office in the community in which you live, even if the election is partisan, as long as you run as an independent. So let's take a city council race in, in Arlington County. I live in Arlington, so that's why I'm going to use Arlington. City council race is partisan. I'm a federal employee. Normally, you would not be able to run in that race, but because Arlington has been designated a specially designated locality and the city council race is in the community, the, the election is in the community in which I live, I would be permitted as a federal employee to run as an independent for that office. For those of you that are interested in, deter in, in, in seeing if you live in one of these localities, 5 CFR Part 733 has a comprehensive list of all the specially designated localities, but the majority are going to be in Virginia and Maryland. There's a couple in California and Georgia, but the majority are in uh, Virginia and Maryland. The last uh, exception here with respect to candidacy applies to less restricted employees. If you are running for party office, that is not considered candidacy for partisan public office, which is what is prohibited, right? So you can't run for public office if it's partisan. But if you're less restricted, you may run for a party office within your political party. So let's say chair of the DNC, chair of the RNC, or um, even like vice chair. There are different positions um, at the national, state, and local level within the political parties, you would be permitted to run for those offices if you're less restricted. And that includes the position of pre precinct committee person. For some reason, federal employees sometimes get confused with this position and they think it's a public office because in many jurisdictions, you select the committee person um, on your primary ballot. So then people think it's a public office, but it's not. It's party office. And so it would be permissible if you're less restricted. And the last prohibition, which is a 24-7 prohibition, and it applies to all federal employees, there is no exception, is that employees may not knowingly solicit or discourage the political activity of anyone with business be pending before their employing office. So... Um, a couple of things about this prohibition. First, it's one of the few that it has to be knowingly. So if, for example, my neighbor, using me as an example, my neighbor um, had business before my uh, office, let's say the, the Hatch Act program at OSC, I would not be permitted as a federal employee to go and knock on his door and encourage him to vote a certain way in an upcoming election. A, because I know he's got business before my office, and the business that he has before my office is pending. It's current, okay? However, if, his, if the case he had before my office happened five years ago and it's now a closed case, I would not be in violation if I knocked on his door and tried to encourage him to vote a certain way because the business is no longer pending, okay? Also... Let's say that you volunteer on behalf of a campaign and you've been asked to canvass a neighborhood and you're thinking, wow, you know, with this prohibition, should I even canvass a neighborhood? I don't know if someone has business before my office here at OPM. The answer is, if you don't know that the individual has business before your office, then you're not in violation if you try to encourage or discourage their political activity. So the answer is yes. You would be permitted to canvass a neighborhood. The only thing is you would avoid those homes where you know someone has business before your office. The other thing quickly here is that the business is specifically identified in the statute. So the, 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 the business that's defined is ongoing audits, investigations, enforcement actions, applications for grants, 
contracts, licenses, permits, rulings, compensation, or certificates. Lastly, the last two slides concern further restricted employees. And um, again, here at OPM, for example, your career SES would be further restricted. And as I said earlier, the further restricted, in addition to everything we've discussed, may not actively participate in political management or political campaigning. And the way the courts have interpreted this phrase is that if you're acting in concert with a political party or a candidate for partisan uh, office, or you're acting on behalf of such entities, you're considered acting in concert. You're actively participating. So examples of things that would be prohibited, as you can see on the slide, is volunteering for a partisan campaign, distributing campaign literature, which, by the way, includes, as a further restricted employee, you can't even forward the emails that you receive from a campaign or, um, or a political party. That's considered distributing campaign literature, even if it's electronic. Holding party office, circulating nominating petitions, making campaign speeches, participating in a partisan voter registration drive, forwarding campaign um, or political party emails, like I just said, organizing party events, speaking on behalf of a candidate, serving as a party delegate, or serving on any committee of the, that, that um, any of the party's uh, committees, even the social committee. Because some people will say to me, it's just a social committee. We organize parties. It doesn't matter that it's a social committee. It's still a committee within a political party. And it would be active participation in political management if you served on one of these committees. Lastly, for further restricted employees, um, there's a couple of, of more expansive restrictions that apply with respect to social media, including that you may not link to the partisan material of a candidate for partisan office, a political party, or partisan political group, and you may not share or retweet the social media pages or post of a candidate for partisan office, political party, or partisan political group. This is viewed as working in concert with the uh, political entity to further distribute their message. So that's why that's prohibited. Penalties, we've talked a little bit about penalties just from some of the examples I've given, but there's a broad range of penalties, anywhere from um, a letter of reprimand to removal. I can tell you that when we typically seek um, disciplinary action, usually the cases involve some a suspension or a removal. I can tell you that right now we're currently litigating two cases before the Merit Systems Protection Board. One involves a doctor who, um, who ran for congressional office, um, so that's one violation. He then took his business cards at the federal agency and on the back printed vote for him uh, and the seat that he was running for. He then also asked some of his patients um, that were patients of his through his job with the federal government to participate in his campaign videos, as well as asking some of his subordinates to participate in his campaign video. So that's one case where we're currently seeking disciplinary action, and we would expect a significant penalty there. And we're also currently um, litigating another case before the board involving an administrative law judge who, during a deportation hearing, uh, proceeded to make favorable remarks uh, promoting the Democratic Party and uh, then a candidate Hillary Clinton in 2016 and disparaging remarks about the Republican Party. And this is all on the record during the deportation hearing. So um, that case is actually one that we're very active in right now. So stay tuned in terms of the outcome. But again, just an ex two, example, two more examples of serious violations of the Hatch Act. The last example that I want to share with you, we never... Um, uh, brought to the board because we were actually settled that case over the summer before filing with the board involves social media activity. We had a Department of Homeland Security employee who posted over 150 posts um, 
on duty or in the federal building showing her support and opposition for candidates in the 2016 presidential election. And um, in addition, she would uh, try to encourage her coworkers at work to vote a certain way and was inviting uh, coworkers to attend campaign rallies. And that case just settled um, for her resignation with a five-year department uh, from federal service. So that, that's one of the more recent uh, cases that, that we sought disciplinary action. Again, if, if we seek disciplinary action, these are usually pretty serious cases. Um, in case you need any assistance, we have a hotline at OSC to, to assist you. Uh, the hotline um, are the top two numbers, the 1-800 and then the 202. And those calls we respond to within 24 hours. And then we have um, an email uh, inbox just dedicated to responding to informal advisory requests, and that's hatchact at osc.gov. And we maintain the confidentiality of these advisory requests. And we normally respond to the um, email advisories within five business days. Less time if it's an easy request, but if it's complicated, it's usually five business days. And I'll take any other questions if there are any remaining. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for a whole lot. I'll ask one okay. final question, and then we'll wrap up. But um, again, it would, it would behoove the listeners to take advantage of those hotline numbers that you just mentioned. So um, we did have uh, two people that asked the same question, essentially. Um, many federal agencies do not own the federal building itself, but instead lease maybe one or two floors in a privately held building. Is the entire building considered a, a federal workspace or only the floors that are leased? That's a great question. I'm actually in a federal building where uh, it's privately owned and we lease only the third and uh, second and third floor. And what is considered the federal building in those circumstances are only the floors occupied by the federal government. So in the building that I just described, only the second and third floors would be considered the federal building. The remaining floors, including the lobby, are not considered the federal building. Thank you. Anna, on behalf of Accountability and Workforce Relations, thank you very much for sharing your expertise during today's live stream. Your presentation provided an outstanding and informational commentary on the Hatch Act and the surrounding issues on political activity in the federal workplace. I want to thank OPM's communications staff for your webcast of this live stream, and thanks to my colleagues in Accountability and Workforce Relations for your work on this live stream as well. Thank you for participating today. We look forward to having you at the next Employee and Labor Relations live stream. Finally, please remember and shortly you will receive an email with a hyperlink to an online evaluation form courtesy of SurveyMonkey.com. Your feedback helps us to plan future sessions and we appreciate your taking the time to complete this survey. Have a great afternoon.